recording. Okay. Welcome. Joining us today is Cynthia Hart Button of the White Bison Association. Cynthia was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and is of Lakota tribe heritage and a descendant of Sitting Bull. It was Cynthia's father who influenced her deep connection and love of animals as he provided nurturing care for sick wildlife and abused circus animals. It was on her father's deathbed when Cynthia learned of her Native American heritage. And this is also when he delivered the message that she was being called upon to care for and protect the white bison. Following her father's death in 1988, Cynthia embarked on her journey to start the White Bison Association, creating a peaceful, safe, and loving sanctuary for these sacred animals. Cynthia and her husband, Charles, are still caring for the bison today. The White Bison Association is a nonprofit and no-kill sanctuary that preserves the rights for the white bison herd to live on organic pastures with fresh, clean water in a safe and private setting. The White Bison Association's mission is to provide educational programs that bring awareness to the importance of the conservation and protection of the white bison and its vital role as the Native American nation's symbol of peace. Welcome, Cynthia. How are you? Oh, I'm great. It's Beautiful, rainy, wonderful day. <laughs> oh, you guys have, have some rain out there, huh? Yeah, just inherited three great Danes, so oh. I'm doing great. <laughs> Wow. Today. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome. Oh. And thank you. Thank you, you for being here today. Welcome, Cynthia. Yeah. Could could you tell us a little bit more on how you first got involved with the white bison herd? Well, it's really funny, as you announced uh, about my father. Um, uh, my mom is from Wales, so she's Welsh. So I want to get my mom in there. Right. Um, my dad was with the Barnum and Brothers Circuses way back when, and uh, I was always trained. All of a sudden, we would have an elephant, or we would have a giraffe, or a zebra, or a Brahma bull, or something coming in, and or foxes, or you know, um, uh, all kinds of different animals. Uh, and it was such a great life. I thought everybody had that life. <laughs> and, uh, of course, he was one of the rescue people back then. Uh, with uh, Mustangs, he brought Mustangs on his the part of the railroad, he owned railroad cards and all that stuff. So I was pretty used to doing animals. And then one day I get a call to go out west to work with Brahma bulls in Sedona with a woman named Mary Lou Keller. And she, uh, she had another one, exotic animals uh, on the outskirts of Sedona between Sedona and Jerome. And uh, I helped her with all this. And then I meet my husband and I'm making a short version of this for you. <laughs> this guy calls my father and said, uh, Yuri, and his name was Jan Jim and he was a, a Cherokee. He says, I've got uh, a couple white buffaloes and I'm gonna need a caretaker. I just found out that I'm probably gonna not live long because he had heart problems and all kinds of stuff. And he was concerned that these animals were protected and uh, he didn't want to give them to the nations because he was not sure if they'd fight over them, you know, how different groups of people fight. And he didn't really know who to. So my dad said, well, let me get a hold of my daughter. This is before he died. And he had prepared me for this. He said, you might be getting calls from people from all over the place with animals and they want you to help them. But he didn't. That's about the limit he did. And then one day I got the call to help move the white buffaloes from uh, Wyoming or Montana, one of those areas, to Flagstaff, Arizona. And I went, OK, I can do that. No problem. So uh, we loaded up the truck and we moved on. No. So we moved the, uh, the buffalo down to Flagstaff near the ski lift. And uh, I started working on them, with them and worth working with them. And one of them was pregnant. And her name was Miracle Moon. And it's so funny, she was born on my father's day, my father's birthday, and she was also born on Orville Looking Horse, the 19th carrier, the white buffalo pipe on the Lakota Nation. And I just thought that was like, whoa, that means something that I have to do. So I decided to take the mission on. But who really convinced me was this little cute baby named Arizona Spirit. Um, he was born from uh, Miracle Moon, and he come running over the hill, down the hill, over to me. And he looked at me and he just sat right down. And huh. so I thought, 
this is a pretty friendly buffalo. I mean, buffaloes aren't that friendly. And he curls up and I'm feeding him and I was giving him apples and just playing with him. And the next thing I know, I've got this great big mama buffalo standing over top of my head going, oh, no, you, you know, you always... <laughs> You know, not to go near like bear babies and all this stuff. And I'm like cornered in a pen. And I'm like, oh, no, what am I going to do? Electric fences, everything. And all of a sudden she laid down and she started licking my arm. And it was mm -hmm. first. And Jim and Dina were kind of like blown away because these animals were reacting to me uh, in an unusual way because they are friendly, but they're not that friendly. Buffaloes are not friendly. And, um, so, of course, my heart just went out to Arizona. So off I went and back into what I was doing. And then I got the call that Jim was passing and I got there really quick because they don't nobody knew how to load them or do anything. So that's how it all got started. And, uh, the nations at that time, nobody knew how to get a hold of the nations or even knew what to do. The, to them, it was just buffaloes. They didn't know about, they knew some of the sacred stuff because Black Elk was there and Leonard Crow Dog and all those people had come and visited and they visited when I was there. And, and to me, they're just skins and family and I didn't think anything of it. I really didn't know the big ceremonial situation of white buffaloes to the nation. And, um, uh, and I learned very quickly. And of course I was part Sundancer, but I knew about the buffaloes, but I didn't know I knew about the white buffalo calf pipe, their prayer pipe that they carry uh, to teach you how to break, pray to great spirit. But I never really knew, you know, I wasn't clued in. I just really wasn't clued. I was just a dingy blonde. And um, so I was educated by the buffaloes, 22 years of being highly educated about peace, prayer, ceremony, uh, honor, integrity, and truth, and unconditional love. Boy, you got to have a lot of that. And these animals really made me humble <laughs> they, they they and my husband too uh, and so go ahead i'm sorry <laughs> and here's the orange cat for for our listeners so cynthia you know you're touching on a an area which i wanted to address next which is the the the, the sacredness the white bison is known to be a very sacred animal to many native americans yeah um, they're Tribes, but I, 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 the main key to the public is what I really want to say is all animals are sacred. Of course, of course. All, you know, they're all loving to the human race. They put they put up with the human design, and they see they see us and they try to come and comfort us and they try to love on us and they try to teach us and um, why they. Uh, to my know, now I'm a Humpapa, which is a division off of the Lakota Nation, and I'm my 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 Lakota or my adopted name, I, I should say, is Little Golden Bear. So I learned the value of healing, and uh, I was a healer, and I was a Jeep tour driver, Grand Canyon, Sedona, and uh, the beauty of the land and the roaming in the land was what kept me humble and just. I felt like a child all the time. And what I really noticed about the buffaloes, that's the energy they are. They're the pathfinders. They're they're always roaming. They're always moving different sceneries, new food, you know, and then they, they leave their little afterthoughts, you know, on the soil to refertilize and, and they don't damage land. And I started learning the language of their nature and what they were being. And then all of a sudden I woke up one day and that's what my nation was trying to tell me, you know, this is what these buffaloes are. They're sacred. Uh, they, they really keep you into the child. They really treat, they teach you directions. They understand they can, they're hearing and they're not really good seeing up close, but far away, they can see danger. They can see the storms. They can see, they really balanced me into nature and being, I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, She's part of the TV fan. She likes to be in front of the cameras. Um, uh, she, it's just, uh, they're very humbling. And our nations, as I said, spiritual um, buffaloes, you know, they, they're peaceful. I don't know how peaceful they are with themselves. They have a pecking order. The female is the patriarch of the, of the herd. Miracle was the herd. The bulls fight over the females and then they get their mate. And that's usually who they are. 
um, the mother, uh, the males eat first, and then the females, and then the children. So that's the basically thing they argue over, and they dance. Oh my gosh, their ceremonial dance is beautiful. At sunset, they kind of the middle, the middle children get up and they start looping into a circle and they push the little ones and all of a sudden the little ones are they're all dancing in a circle and then all of a sudden the bulls come out and they're all dancing and they just go in these big circles and the loop to loop into a figure eight and it's the most beautiful thing they go for probably 10 to 15 minutes in their ceremony and then they all kind of fit their spot and they watch the sun go down and they watch the sun go up of course they're grazing in between them but Hey, what's for me they made me stop they made me stop and look at the sky they made me uh, understand that these rituals are important so you know what i started dancing in v8s i started doing ceremonies with people and we would do the same thing it's a sun dance with them or they're not not the sun dance there's the sun going down and we would dance so wow. they they brought that dance to me and to the today I do that dance every day. I mean, there's a few days I missed with, the, you know, uh, with weather, but they never meet. A, they never every day. And they love to swim, by the way. I don't know if a lot of you know that buffaloes like to swim. Do not know that. Question, I'm, I'm so I'm still stuck on the, the buffalo and they're dancing. I'm sorry. I'm like mesmerized by the thought of this. I can visualize it. Is this something that your buffalo herd does, or is this like known for all buffalo herds to do this? Do you know? Here's what I can tell you. I'm not an authority on other people's bu buffaloes or the wild. I only know the stories. I have been out in the range with buffaloes. Uh, there are some of them I've seen dance, but not really. They're roaming, they're grooming, they're playing. Uh, they're, they do run in circles back and forth. They kind of run back forth but these ones do figure eights now these guys have 219 acres here so in that fields i have the fields at 40 acres you know two lots and it could be that because of they're in a confined you know lot area that might be the figure eight but uh i've had them you know they've lived in oregon they lived in flagstaff they lived in montana wyoming california and now in ohio and they I'll do the dance. So I think it's a, a real rituals uh, to them. So, but I can't speak about other buffaloes. I'm not an authority on that. I understand other buffaloes, but I, this herd I'm with 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that's where I'm coming from. Wow. Now I have kind of a two pronged question. One, from a spiritual point of view, what are some of the beliefs that surround the white bison? And then the other part of that is how many white bison are roughly are exist in North America? Um, I'm going to answer the second one first. First of all, no one has that knowledge. It's one in 10 million is a white buffalo. Okay. One in 10 million. Yeah. One in 10 million. And of course, some people, you know, uh, we have to remember, we're not associated with the Brown Bison Association because that's meat products. Right. We are product animals really is what we are and, and endangered because there's not that many. Uh, we had a herd and then when we moved, we lost some because we were in the California fires. They weren't burned up, they just had smoke inhalations. And to my knowledge, to my knowledge, I would say there's probably less than 40. Um, when we were the herd, we had 21. And then I hear other people having them, but we're the only ones that DNA tested that we are, you know, 99.5% buffalo because they always had that extra five, but it's considered after 92% uh, your white buffalo. So the other ones haven't been tested because I think I um, might have a story there about the, um, there's what they call beefalo. And a lot of times they started crossbreeding buffalo and cow um, uh, to get a, a, a white, uh, usually it's a charlet cow. Um, uh, to breed because it's more docile. It's not as dangerous. I mean, you can pet them. They're a little bit more uh, peaceful in their, in their presence with humans. So uh, honestly, all I know is our herd is the only one, if you want to look at law, government, whatever it's called, rules, regulations, uh, wildlife, we're the only one registered as full bloods. So yeah. honestly, 
but I still think there are some because I have talked to some people and they just don't want the public because it's it, they don't want to go through the headaches I've been through because they know what headaches I've been through. Sure. Now, I, these buffaloes originated from lower Texas in the far corner where there was a Native American tribe. I had heard that there were white buffaloes down there when I was a young girl. But of course, I wasn't interested in buffalo. So there was no I was more interested in bears, uh, you know, uh, spirit bears, which I'm connected to. And the white lions with Linda Tucker. Um, uh, she has those in Africa. So I kind of I'm more lions, tigers and bears and horses. Of course, horses have been in my life forever and big dogs, you know, wolves and great Danes and things like that. So um, but I really can't answer that question. But I'm assuming I'm assuming less probably less than 40 wow. white bubbles, if they're real they're not real unless they're dna tested and and what are the what are the um what are some of the beliefs that surround them like if, if there's a newborn white, white well bubble, what 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 happens it, there well it's the well there's a couple different tribes believe in different things so some of them believe that the white buffaloes are, are returning it's the time of the world change Da 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 da, uh, and some major stuff is going to happen. Um, it's an omen that uh, 200 years ago, when the prayer pipe was given white buffalo calf woman, and that's a long story. And I really feel that is in, in a ceremony. If you want to know that, you can read it in books. But I don't like to speak of it unless I'm in a ceremony uh, situation because I'm very sacred to ceremony. But the white buffalo uh, calf woman had talked to you. You said 200 years ago, or is it 2000 years ago? 2000 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a little dyslexic. No, so no, thank you. Okay. I just was, I, I'm just trying to remember what I read. Yeah. So when she gave the prayer pipe, the prayer pipe was to teach us how to pray to your creator. If it's God, Buddha, whoever your belief is, it's your higher power, whatever that terminology is in your belief structure. Mine's nature, so I call it creator. Right. So uh, it's to teach you. You load the, you do the directions, the four corners, you do the whole ceremony, tobacco, sage, or connect, whatever you're using in the prayer pipe. And it teaches you how to honor all the elements outside of you, earth, wind, and fire, it, uh, the mountains, the, the sky, the, you know, it teaches you how to hold nature in a sacred space. And, um, and then there were, when she came, she brought the dances, she brought many stories, she brought everything to their people. And they started the sun dance, the ghost dance. And there's a lot of ceremonies. And I prefer uh, a chief to talk to you about that. Um, I, you know, I just feel better. I, I, it's like, I don't talk for people. It's like, if somebody asked me about you guys, I would say, well, just talk to them. So I'm going to say to you, just talk to the nations. They'll tell you their ceremonies or their dances and they have books. And I have a book out on, on what our rituals and dances is, but I would say, and some of them believe that the white Buffalo is also uh, a time uh, uh, moving, like you need to move from where you are. I mean, they've made me move like six times already, but they're <laughs> all, movements you know they they their movements but i would think that the teachers and the lessons that i've learned from them uh is basically how to live in my skin how, how this human design works in the balance of my organic gardens i feed myself i i'm off the grid i um the only me mechanical thing i have is your my phone and my computer other than that, I'm off the grid on things. Um, and I, I, if something happened, I can survive because I know how to survive with my nature. And I think that's what the buffaloes teach. And I think a lot of animals teach that. Horses teach that. You know, um, uh, a lot of animals teach that. Lions. I like the animals that are vegetarian because I'm more vegetarian. And so the buffaloes, I was glad that I didn't have to work with the lions and the bears because they're more meat eaters. Sure. So I. I was kind of very thankful that I got buffaloes because they don't eat meat. <laughs> well, I think we can we can certainly all learn a lot from from watching animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially your dogs and cats. Cats and dogs are they heal the heart. Oh yeah, they heal us. Her That's for sure. I've been saying that forever, um, or experiencing it. Frankly, I think we all have. <laughs> um, so Cynthia. Then what do you think 
you said you don't want to speak for them, but I, you know, your part, Lakota yourself. So I'll ask you from your own perspective. And I, I ask you this knowing already what the answer is, because, you know, I try to live my life every day, taking my knowledge from the animals and from nature as well, just as you do. And so, you know, what is, what is it that we can or should be doing to create a more po peaceful coexistence with the earth, with mother earth and well, so her animals? I think that the human design, the animals are trying to teach kindness and respect. Mm -hmm. And the big problem right now is there's not enough kindness and animals don't lie. You mm -hmm. don't find that lies. And I think they're great examples of speaking the truth. Uh, they let you know everything. And I think people um, get greedy and I think and hoarders and they start hoarding things instead of giving. You have to give to receive and everything's in motion. And the only thing in life that you're guaranteed is change. Right. And that's the biggest message that the animals give me. Okay, you got four seasons. Well, now we got more like 21 seasons. Uh, no, pun intended. But um, you have to learn to go with the flow. Um, if I would ever have to be regimented to something, it would probably last for five minutes. Because I look down there and I see these big brown eyes going. Rum, 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 and all of a sudden they're moving. And they're like, come with me. So they never let me stay in a spot. So I just think that animals have more knowing than us and uh, are more awareness. We have the knowing, but you can't you, just because you know something doesn't mean it's without the awareness of the knowing you can't do anything. So I think animals are way more aware than we are because they're always in that, that, ah, oh God, it's such a divine space where animals. I was thinking that it's like a divine universal flow and they're yeah. just. It's, uh, it's not something that's thought about. They just feel it and they go with it. And we muck everything up with our, our thoughts and our brain and our ego and it all gets involved. And... and and what's really cool about the buffaloes, but I think dogs and cats do this. If somebody comes on the property that doesn't belong on the property, my bulls will like go sit, like come down and they'll get real puffed up and they'll go, oh, <laughs> and I'm like, Okay, let me guide that person right out of here, you know, lucky and sweet. But they they know when somebody's on the property um, that shouldn't be on it. And they also know, but I right now I've got uh, birds down there. They're, they're uh, big black um, condors. I don't know why they came in. Usually we get the big black uh, uh, vultures in. But we have condors here right now. I have like 19 of them in the tree. Oh. And I'm like, oh. okay, what are you guys doing here? You know, they're all hanging with the buffalo. They like the buffalo. And uh, usually it's peacocks or doves or something that the buffaloes draw. And I, I've tried to find out why, but I think there's some kind of spiritual. But these guys have come in and they kind of hang with them. And then all of a sudden they go and the next set of animals come in. It's very interesting how animals group with each other. And it, uh, you know, we get bunnies and a lot of times the bunnies will ride on the back, uh, goes in that hair where the buffalo's head is, you know, because it's a big nest. And the bunnies will have their bunnies in there and they walk around with bunnies on their heads. And then when the bunnies are done, they go off. And um, it's very interesting that they protect, protect bunnies. But we had a cat, big cat come through. And uh, the cat came down drinking of water, kind of hung with the buffaloes, didn't bother them. And they were kind of rubbing their backs and doing this. And we see bears come in, doesn't face buffalo. They're, they have this communication with each other that is just so electrified. And um, I had a wolf that came out of the woods uh, here. I, it wasn't a coyote. It's some called Coda wolf. And it was about 160 pounds. And I saw it. And I, okay, I'm going to back off here a minute. And uh, all of a sudden, two of my males saw them and come running up to the fence. And um, the, the wolf looked at them and then looked at me and then looked at them. And he said, okay, I'm out of here. But it's they have this sense and they don't speak to each other. It's all done telepathically. Right. It's amazing. You know, I wish we were. Could you imagine everybody being telepathic? <laughs> I mean, 
just well we are but we just we, don't know. yeah i was going to say we have the capacity we all do we just we aren't um open enough or we don't trust ourselves enough to to trust ourselves <laughs> yeah yeah exactly I, follow that intuition yeah cynthia no this this might be a little out of your realm for the the overall question but it kind of ties into what erica just asked when you when you look at the the history of the North American bison as a whole, um, you know they were nearly wiped out in the 1800s and early 1900s um, from you know in, into the tens of millions that were uh, in North America down to just a few hundred. Um, yeah. Today, with with all the habitat loss and the uh, the fact that their migration routes are completely fragmented. Now, any herds that do exist in the wild are um, they're they're separated by you know miles and miles and miles and separated by cities and highways and everything else. What what is the best thing that we could do uh, to ensure that bison have as a whole North American bison have uh, a brighter future? And and I guess that that's kind of a a big loaded question, but um, no. Great one. I'm thankful that you asked that because, uh, you know, maybe a little less golf courses and maybe letting nature come back in. And, uh, you know, right now Yellowstone has problems. I mean, people are getting killed by buffaloes all the time and they migrate. You know, they're like we do. Some people that live in the north, they go to the south to get out of the snow. So do buffaloes. Oh, they'll say, oh, yeah, but they love the snow. They don't like super deep snow. And they like uh, they they like to migrate into grass areas because they depend on their food in nature outside. And it's very important for these uh, preservation areas. And there's a lot of them opening up. And Ted Turner was probably one of the greatest uh, buffalo. I mean, he had the, one of the largest herds. Now the Lakota Nation has got a big herd. But you have to let them migrate. And, and, and we have to respect. But again, you can't have buffaloes walking down the city or walking down a country road. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a little intense. It would be wonderful if lions and tigers and bears could be come one with humans, but I think that's uh, going to be millennium's time from now. But um, where people are, there's a lot of people out there becoming more aware. And I want to tell you about the railroad. You know, they're giving all these men Buffalo Bill, which is a cousin from my father's side over there. It wasn't the men that stopped the railroad. It was Roosevelt's wife. I just want a correction on that. <laughs> because they make these movies and they say, oh, yeah, uh, Roosevelt did this. And it was Roosevelt's wife that put her foot down and said, stop killing buffalo. Wow. You know, and he respected her that much and he honored her that much because that was her only gift that she wanted in life was people stop killing the buffalo. So I want to make that correction in all the history books and movies out there. How do I know? I hung with people, my father's people, who were all in that history. Wow. And story after story after story, how many gifts that they sent Mrs. Eisen, uh, President Eisenhower's wife um, uh, for doing the job she did in stopping the railroads. So that's my little correction I have to give. But I think more and more um, nations, Indian nations, um, and you know, a lot of the white people that have farms and stuff, uh, buffaloes are great for farming, but you know, they multiply and they don't know what to do with them other than make food products out of them. But most people can't handle buffalo. Uh, they're dangerous and and it's it's not something like here's your food now go away or let me put you in that field they buffaloes want to uh, if you're having them on a farm they want to be personable with you just like your cows and horses but you have to know how to handle them you know and it, it's an education that has been lost and I feel like it's coming back I really do I feel more and more we're we're bringing the population back now white buffaloes are a little bit different. First of all, they don't like freezing cold climate. So if you have a barn and it's heated in the winter, fine. Uh, these are like futon buffaloes. They eat vegetables and the tropical fruits. They like 110 degree temperatures. Um, they like to be in a barn. If the, They like to sit in an overshade. So I have bankments that are cut out so they can go in there and lay. Where your other buffaloes are all out roaming. And you have to remember, there's the Canadian wood buffaloes and the plains, and we have more plains. We have two Canadians, but um, 
they're mostly uh, the plains buffalo. And you got to give them places to roam. They like to sit under shade trees and they, they like a little bit of hill, not a lot of hills because they lose their equilibrium just like a cow does. And so, uh, you know, uh, I think if we got rid of a lot of golf cart, uh, golf areas and a lot of areas that are big spaces, I think malls are finally shutting down. I think uh, our economy is changing. So yeah. I think get back into nature. They're putting gardens on their houses. They're, I, I think we're changing, maybe not fast enough, but, you know, this plague really woke us up, yeah. whether good or bad. It really woke us up. It made people come home to their families and you see the buffaloes they love their families i I, somebody else said will you sell me a buffalo and i'm like this is the mother's kid and they're in breeding i don't like to do that sometimes a little bull go but you know they're family oriented and i think buffaloes teach you family and i didn't mean to go off on that tangent to you but um it was just that came up to me as long as you have a preservation and the group can stay together you're on Nice. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you're, you're exactly right. If, if we can let nature, if we can leave nature alone and stop taking from it, a lot of things will, will heal fairly quickly. Yeah. Yeah. It's the healing of nature. And, um, we, I thank gosh, you know, our ancestors made these beautiful national parks, you know, somebody up there got a clue, you know, if we would just make more park areas or you call them park, I mean, parks, just let everything go back to nature and groom it and help it and nurture it and, and help the bees. I mean, you know, there's a circle when they put the wolves back in Montana, everything went back into the ba- balance. You know, they, they take certain animals out that balance our nature and we, we, they're there for a reason. Mm-hmm. They're keystone species and they need to be there for a reason. Absolutely. Um, Can I just clarify for my own brain? I'm not sure. I want to, for our listeners, get clarification on that wonderful story you just shared about the, uh, was it the wife of Eisenhower or Roosevelt? I don't remember which one. I'm sorry. It was Roosevelt's wife. Okay. I just want to clarify so that anybody listening, if they want to look that up. That's yes. uh, that's a really cool thing. Thank you for sharing that. I love it. That's great. It was an amazing. Um, my grandmother and grandfather talked about them all the time, and they were real personable people. Wow. And they had such a great love. And there are men today out there that are still keeping the buffaloes as you watch the videos, and they're bringing the preservations back. And it, you know, the cool thing is, is it's not about a meat production. It's about bringing the buffalo back. I'm on my eighth generation. And most people, I, when I'll say to them, how, how many generations do you have? And he goes, well, what's that about? What well, we just buy them and then kill them and then get another set. And I'm like, okay, you're, you're meat production. Right. Right. You're a sanctuary. Let's be clear about that. You're yeah. Yeah. not kill. You're taking care of these animals and giving them a place of peace and sanctuary for them to live out their lives happily and safely. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. our goal. <laughs> so far, we're so good. Amazing. And I, you know, I just want to say, uh, Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us here today. This has mm-hmm. been a, a wonderful time chatting with you. Jeff and I have been looking forward to this for a while now to, to talk about the white bison and how important they are. And we hope you enjoyed your time with us as, as much as we have. And Perhaps you can invite us down sometime to visit the white bison and maybe even record on site with you in the herd. That would oh, be fun. Time. You yeah. are definitely welcome to come down anytime. Thank you. And we are private. We are a private area. It's not open to the public, but um, people that, that. Are, yeah. will, you know, call us and we'll open the doors and people buffaloes will let you in <laughs> yeah i was gonna ask you if people do if they're interested anyone listening or watching today wants to visit your uh white bison sanctuary or donate um to the cause what would be the best way for them to do that should they just go to your website yeah there's a website called white bison association.com and org uh, they're both together and uh, you have to call for an appointment because uh, we have cameras and high security on these animals and uh, uh, we do have some rules and regulations before you come in 
uh, with certain scents and smells and you can't smoke or drink or there's a lot of restrictions uh, to be on our property. But if you call um, and please remember when you're calling, if you can leave a donation, if you come down, because I have to hire our people to do security when you're here. Uh, and so we, we definitely don't turn donations down. We appreciate anything. And uh, volunteers, we have volunteers where we train if people are into our training programs, if people want to learn about them. Some people will say, I, I think I want Buffalo, but could you train me? Yeah, we can. That's amazing. I think that's wonderful. Yes. Well, yeah. We'll also have your website and contact information located on our podcast show's profile page, which will be published on all the major podcast platforms. <laughs> and folks, you can listen to more great podcasts on All About Animals Radio by going to Apple, Spotify, Amazon, TuneIn, and Google, and also subscribing. And you can also find us on All About Animals Radio on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thank you all for joining us here. And please remember, use your voice for the animals today and every day, if possible. And as the buffaloes say, oh! <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> be well, everyone. Thank you and namaste. Peace be with you. Bye, guys. Bye -bye. Thank you. Okay.